You've watched the videos, you've seen the ads, you hopefully haven't bought the expensive courses. Everyone is pushing a different property strategy, but there's a problem. Most of them don't work, at least not today. So I'm gonna break a whole load of popular property strategies down into three categories. Those that are dead and buried, some that are past their prime, and some that are fine but struggling right now. Then at the end, I'll share a couple that will still work in 2024. In case you don't know, I'm a co-founder of Property Hub and we've been putting out a weekly property podcast for more than 10 years. So we've seen a lot of trends come and go during that time. So let's start with the strategies that just don't work anymore and probably never will again. The first is aggressive refinancing. So this is where the value of a property goes up and you extend your mortgage to pull out cash to invest in more. Now you can still do that, but I said aggressive refinancing and it used to be very aggressive indeed. In the run up to the last financial crash, property prices were going up so quickly and lenders were so enthusiastic about lending that you could buy a property and increase the loan on it on the first day, pulling some or all of your money back out so you could buy more. They haven't been able to do that for a number of years, but you could still say buy a property at a discount and then refinance it for its full value six months later. And on occasions that may still be possible, especially if you've done some work to improve the property. But lenders are so much more reluctant than they were to give increases in value. And you've also got the issue of stress tests where your borrowing is assessed not only against the value of the property, but the value of the rent. So it could be the case you've got equity in the property, but the rent hasn't increased by enough to give you the extra borrowing. So can refinancing still form part of your plans? Yes, but it's best thought of as a bonus rather than the backbone of how you're going to finance the expansion of your portfolio. Another strategy that is effectively dead and buried is lease options. And this is one that used to be pushed very heavily by property trainers. In a nutshell, this strategy involved finding a property where the owner wanted to sell, but wasn't able to sell because they didn't have any equity in that property so they weren't able to sell it for a price that would clear their mortgage. As an investor, you would then offer to buy that property for a fixed higher price in the future, but immediately take over the responsibilities of paying the mortgage and other costs on that property, moving in a tenant to be able to do that. That would allow the owner to move on, allow you to generate rental income from that property immediately, and if the property goes up in value higher than the price you agreed, you could exercise the option to buy that property and cash in. Sounds great, and this has always sounded better than it really is. It's pitched as a way of getting involved in property investment with little of your own money. But in practice, actually finding these opportunities, negotiating them, structuring them, it's way harder than it sounds. But the reason it's now dead and buried is it hinges on finding properties where the owner can't sell because they've got little or no equity. And now the property cycle has moved on far enough that there are very few parts of the country where there's a significant number of properties where that is actually the case. So if there is a gigantic property crash, prices come down by 20%, then maybe lease options will be reborn. But for now, you can put this in the category of something that sounds great, but really doesn't work. So those are effectively dead. But what about strategies that still work, but are past their prime? Well, one of those is HMOs, houses in multiple occupancy or multi-lets to you and me. There was a time, maybe five years ago or so, when everyone was getting into HMOs. It was the flavor of the month and people were going into it because the yields, on paper at least, were so much higher. If you take a property and you rent it out by the room, then you can achieve a higher rent than if you rented out the entire property. So for investors looking for cash flow, HMOs were very attractive. And across the country, you're seeing more and more properties being converted into HMOs. Now, there is, of course, a demand for properties being rented out by the room, possibly even a growing demand given that rents are increasing so much. But what we have seen over the last few years is an oversupply of HMOs in many places and an increase in the legislation and the complexity of operating one of these properties. Now, they can still work, but you have to get the standard right and you have to get the location very right. And recently, we've seen a reversal of the HMO gold rush with people selling out of that type of property and the buyers then converting them back into single residential units again. And those buyers are exiting because they just couldn't make them work because they didn't get the location right. Or they found that those great returns they're getting on paper were actually quite a lot of hard work and were reduced significantly by their cost. The next strategy past its prime is actually a subset of HMOs, which is student rentals. So if you had a big property in a student area, you used to be able to rent it out room by room, not worry about the quality all that much, and students would pay you a really healthy rent. I used to own a property like that and I sold it a number of years ago 
because I could see where things were going, which is an increase in purpose-built competition from the universities themselves and other professional providers, and also a shift in student preferences. Because students are now paying a lot of money to be there, they expect more. And more and more students, especially international students, aren't living in what you'd consider student housing at all, and are living in the mainstream private rented market, often in city centre flats with good amenities. Now, of course, I'm not saying that student rentals don't work at all. They absolutely can do, but anyone who stays in the sector is gonna to have to work a bit harder than they did in the past. And it's those properties in the best locations that have got the best standards that are going to thrive, while those that are in secondary areas or where the landlord's been a bit lazy, they're really gonna struggle. The next strategy that's past its peak is gonna upset some people, and that is holiday lets. Now, there's been a boom in holiday lets over recent years for a couple of reasons. One, of course, is COVID. More and more people holidaying in the UK, therefore more demand. And the other is tax. The tax treatment of furnished holiday lets is more favorable than for buy to let. So more and more people have been going in that direction. As a result of this influx of supply and people remembering that going on holiday abroad is actually quite good fun, I think there's a risk of an oversupply. I think it's highly likely that the tax advantage they benefit from will be withdrawn. And I also think we're gonna see more in the way of legislation. We're probably gonna see more licensing of holiday lets, possibly even restrictions on their numbers. So can you start out with holiday lets today and do well? Yeah, you absolutely can, but it's gonna be possibly a bit more tricky than it used to be. And you need to be prepared for changes to come in the future. Then there are strategies that are struggling at the moment. And in this category, I'd put flipping properties and property development or conversions. And the reason for both of those is the same. The market is slow. It's a weak property market. Because both of these strategies involve buying and then selling, you could benefit from that weak market at the point of buying. You could get a better price on your way in, but you're gonna struggle more to get the price that you want or even get a sale at all on the way out. And because these strategies are so cash intensive, you need to get to the end and make that sale so you can then move on to the next projects. So I don't think the market is kind to this strategy today, but that's just today. In six months time, it could be completely different. And in the meantime, of course, you can make it work. People will be making this work right now, but you need to be more cautious with your numbers. So I'd say if you're going into this today, make sure that it'll still be profitable to you, even if you're forced to sell at a price below what you'd like to think you can get because you need to offload it quickly and just move on. So that's a whole load of strategies that aren't working, either permanently or just right now. Is there anything left that does work? Well, yes, there are a couple of evergreen strategies that work in pretty much any market and always will do. The first of those is adding value to property, buying and refurbing. If you're buying a property that needs work and then doing it up, you're doing something useful and you will be rewarded for that eventually. If you're planning to refinance after that refurbishment, you might need to wait a bit longer and be patient because the current market, with it being weaker, with lenders being more cautious, you might find that valuers are not so enthusiastic about giving you the valuation that you feel you deserve. But as long as you're not in a rush, you'll be rewarded eventually. And in the meantime, you can at least charge a higher rent as a result of the quality now being better. And finally, there's the vanilla that never goes out of style. Just buying a property, printing it out, holding onto it for a long time. The current market is actually particularly kind to this strategy because the market is weaker, so you can negotiate a better deal on your way in. Rents are exploding, so you can rent it out for a good amount and you'll have plenty of applicants. And then once you've bought, whatever happens in the market doesn't really matter until you decide it's time to sell. So you can pick your moment and sell into a particularly strong market in the future. So all that matters is that you're not forced to sell at any point. And that's why boring old buy and hold is what I do and it will never go out of style. Barring something absolutely insane happening, there's always gonna be demand for good quality properties. So as long as you can stay in the market and you're not forced out, you're always gonna do okay. Now, of course, you've got to consider political risk. Landlords are not the most popular. There's more legislation to come and it probably will get worse before it gets better. But ultimately, like I said, rental properties are needed. So governments may push things as far as they can, but I think they're always gonna to have to leave it in a state where renting out property is viable. Otherwise, there'll be big problems. So if you've been following a strategy that's struggling, it might be time to adapt. But what if you were just getting started? Well, watch this video next, where I explain exactly what I'd do if I was starting over again in property right now.